the man who needs no introduction, Scott Puteski. Uh, <laughs> hey, you welcome to the right. Static Hour. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. You're my, sure, you're my first guest of the new year. Uh, Happy New Year's. Woo-hoo. Happy New Year's. Uh, did you have Did you have a good holiday? Yeah, it was uh, pretty good. Well, that's good. I um, Fort Lauderdale and uh, saw some bands. Uh, meeting Manson, who approached who about putting a band together, and did you know him before? That uh, first meeting, when, when uh, he talked to you about uh, a band and whatnot, uh, I knew Brian for a couple weeks, uh, not a long time. Um, we used to hang out at a place called the Reunion Room in Fort Lauderdale, and he approached me because he had some writing that he wanted to turn into songs, but he had no uh, musical education or or uh, anything like that. So he needed right. someone who was a uh, songwriter or, or, or someone who could play to help right. him flesh out his ideas musically. And we started recording in January of 1990. Okay. Uh, uh, what did you think of him when he first approached you about putting a band together? Well, I liked his ideas. And uh, I have to admit, I, I like that he didn't know anything about music, so I could be in charge of the music. <laughs> right. <laughs> which which wound up being uh, uh, the 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 opposite, the uh, the ironic opposite later on. So right. uh, yeah, I mean, just he he we both had um, uh, what am I going to say? Um, we both had a wide variety of tastes in uh, bands and music, so uh, you know it was a matter of anything goes. It was you know I, I didn't limit him to anything, and he didn't limit me to anything. Right, right. So uh, uh, you uh, know, so we just did whatever. I mean, it, it wasn't serious. I didn't take it seriously. Right, right. You, you know what Manson's vision was at that time, and and the, the style that you were playing, it, it just seemed like a like a perfect marriage of music, lyrics, and art. I mean, it was—it really was like Dr. Seuss meets Dr. Death. You know, your your styles at that time complemented each was, other so was. well. It wasn't like we set out to to make uh, make a big impression. I mean, you know, Manson wanted to, but I didn't. I didn't take it that seriously. Um, okay. Or I didn't. I, I didn't have as much. Um, what do you call it? I didn't. I didn't have as much drive for it as he did. I wasn't as. It wasn't an, an ambitious project to me. It was a fun project. Looking back at the early days, you know, it was. You say it was fun for you. Um, does anything stand out in your mind, like a, maybe a specific song or a specific performance that made you step back and think, you know, what this might just be fun, but we really have something going here. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think in 1992. Uh, it was a big evolution because we were we went from um, in ninety one we went from a uh, drum machine to a uh, live drummer uh, Sarah Lee Lucas and right. after that the songwriting changed a little bit and became a little more collaborative and definitely more interesting I think I can't think of a particular well I'll, I'll say this a particular performance that really made me feel like there was a change going on was our live radio performance on uh, WYNF's radio class show from Tampa, Florida. That was in April of 92. Okay. So that was uh, recordings of that that I'd really like to see released because it's a, it's a really, they're really good performances and they're really good recordings. Right. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's a significant moment in, uh, in the band's evolution and the songs, I think, uh, the song "Thrift" and the song "Suicide Snowman" are uh, are the most significant ones to me that that signaled a a change in growth because they were they were different from our material. They were different. They were a little different from the material we typically had, but they were very different from anything anybody else had. So I think with those, with Thrift and Suicide Snowman, other musicians started taking us a little more seriously. Don Wayne Gacy, Pogo, as uh, he's most known by the fans, he was in the band 
before he even played an instrument, which ended up being keyboard. <laughs> uh, did he have any musical input pre-keyboard, or was he really just there to help create the the live spectacle? Uh, well, he was a he was a performer before he was uh, a player. To be particular, uh, there's a cl- there's a show. Uh, there was a show on uh, July 4th at a place called Club New down in uh, Miami Beach, uh, 1990. Okay. And he wasn't uh, he he had hung out with us and he was, you know, we were waiting for him to to get a sampler. To, uh, to play samples, but he didn't, he didn't have any keyboard knowledge. It was just something functional. Uh, right. That to our sound, it was something that he wanted to do. And he, uh, at this club news show, he was he was on stage um, in a, a leather jacket and camouflage pants and an army helmet, playing with army men. And that's all they right. were doing. And that was right. that stood out to people like, "What the hell was that? What was that guy doing?" It was a great, <laughs> great little bit of theater. What was the songwriting process like during the the Spooky Kids era? Uh, I mean, was there a specific method, or was every song crafted in a different way? Uh, we were, we really didn't uh, have a typical uh, a typical. Uh, Source for for what we did. We uh, okay, we didn't have no formula. We had, we, we had very simple. We had very simple uh, musical rules, like nothing too long, and things would only be repeated a certain amount of times. And you know, very very, we we're very practical about it uh, okay. because we didn't want to get, we didn't want to go, we didn't want to do anything to make the the tunes unlistenable. Like you know, in the early '90s, there was a lot of. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, jammy sort of bands that had like six minute songs and it was you know that was just boring but it was right. so popular to an extent and we wanted to avoid that you know we right. we really walked we really subconsciously walked a line between being palatable and enjoyable and disgusting and deplorable because okay. we knew that like if we were in the middle if you're in the middle people will hate you or love you but either way, they'll talk about you. Right, right. So, so we made we made sure that you know our sound was appealing, but then we would do something weird and gross during the show as part of the performance. Okay. You know. So, okay. but as far as songwriting goes, I I, I typically would have um, a whole composition that I would bring to the band, and they would add their parts, or I would tell them what to play, and Brian would add his lyrics. Um. Okay. Yeah, where, where the ideas came from could have uh, could have been anything. You right. originally recorded the album Portrait of an American Family in Florida, but you, you had to go out to L.A. to re-record it. What what exactly went wrong That's in right. Florida? <laughs> I don't think anything went wrong. What happened was we recorded uh, with a guy named Rolly Mossman, and it was what was it summer of '93, uh, and I liked what we did. I thought it was good. Right. I thought it was definitely good enough to release. But Trent got the the first the first uh, mastered cut of it, and he said, "Wow, it sounds like a really good demo." Right. So I was uh, very deflated at that, and he decided we should go out to L.A. and re-record half the tunes and remix half the tunes. So All right. So that's what happened. That's the that's the final. Uh, product of uh portrait so okay uh and for anybody listening who who isn't familiar, I, I, don't, that... I don't think it was totally I, I just want to make my point i don't think it's totally okay. it was totally necessary it's still a good product but it it i don't think it it needed to to be reworked like that the music right. was still yeah. there the music was good enough it didn't need oh, to yeah. sound like yeah. it was trent Reznor's product you know so Gidget played bass on the album, but he was out of the band shortly after that uh, due to his drug abuse. Was right. the band still was the band still making decisions at that point, or had Manson taken full control by then, and w- was he calling all the shots at that point? No, the band still had uh, had a voice, had more much more of a voice than say in 1995 or so. Okay. Okay. We were just, uh, so, uh, 
at, at that time, though, that that was like ninety four, late ninety four, mid ninety four. At that time, we were we were all thinking more along the lines of the whole band rather than you know ourselves individually. You know, so when we started quitting our day jobs, so to speak. Right. So, so unfortunately, okay. with, with 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 Brad, that's you know that's something that had to be done because we were really gaining good progress and we couldn't, you know, he was holding oh, yeah. us back. Definitely. Okay, so Gidget was fired. He was replaced by Twiggy. And then, I guess shortly after that, Sarah was fired and replaced by Ginger Fish. And then, now now that lineup, uh, I guess, is what fans consider to be the second incarnation uh, of the band. And from a fan's perspective, you know, this is from my perspective and, and a lot of other fans, Twiggy joining the band is really when the dynamic changed. I mean, before that, you were easily the strongest songwriter in the band. And now that Twiggy came on board on bass, Manson not only had another a really strong songwriter, but Twiggy seemed to uh, be his right-hand man as well. Um, did you get the sense at that time that the dynamic of the band was changing, or had it been a little sketchy before that? Uh, it was a little sketchy before that. Uh, I, I I felt that that Twiggy coming in would uh, would add something. It would add a, add something a little different. It would give us a little more variety. But uh, unfortunately, Manson started you know leaning on him more for uh, for riffs and song ideas and in general. So right. I I, okay. I could. I could I wasn't sure how it was changing. I knew it was changing, but I wasn't sure how it was going to go. You know, every Halloween, I end up seeing a, a list of, like, the scariest music videos, and Sweet Dreams is almost always number one. And and that's <laughs> your guitar style driving. I mean, that that's your guitar style driving that cover. You know, with due credit to the Eurythmics, um, your style is the driving force behind that uh, song. How exactly did that song come about that first song like who brought that idea to the table uh i'm not 100 percent sure i think uh, either i brought it up or brian brought it up um i honestly am not sure one of us one he or i um okay but i, I thought it was an interesting challenge okay. because it's the synth- synthesizer driven tune the original that is yeah, and I yeah. liked it as a as a musical challenge. Like, how how would you, as a guitar player, how would you redo this? So I felt, well, yeah. Yeah. I could copy the melody exactly, but then it's going to sound cheesy. Like I I couldn't think of anything better, you know. So I just really yeah. really stripped it down and just made it simple and used the wah for effect, you know. But uh, I, yeah. I'm proud of it. There's there's a couple different recordings. There's a couple different arrangements. Uh, Oh, okay. That that can be heard on my, on my demos. It's interesting. Interesting okay. from a historical analytical point. Eventually, returned to the studio and you started working on Antichrist Superstar, which was far more darker than anything you had previously done. Uh, when Manson went, started going in a darker direction. Did you see that as a natural evolution of the band, or d- did it raise any concerns for you? I mean, how, how did you feel about that? I was concerned because I thought it was I thought it was too much. I mean, we had gotten rid of the Spooky Kids name, but that didn't mean we have to we had to get rid of the Spooky Kids feel and the ideas. Right, right. And I thought this was just too much. It seemed like too much of a personal I want to do it this way um, vibe. Yeah. As far as as far as yeah, that, Brian yeah. Manson wanting to wanting to make a statement. It's like this, you know, it doesn't need to be. So metalized. It doesn't need to be so long. There don't need to be so many songs on it. You know, the 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 concept isn't really fully developed, and it's 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 a good record, but it's not. You know, it didn't need to be. It didn't need to be about scary. It didn't need to be about shocking. Okay. And all the uh, okay. all the stuff about numerology and you know hidden references, and it's just it, it could have been could have been done better.